Terra uh, is very active uh, in particularly in immigrant rights in Wisconsin. Uh, he's with the most important immigrant rights organization in the state, Voces de la Frontera, but he's also the past president and still board member of Centro Hispano of Dane County. So and he's very familiar with Irma Alicia's work and has known her for quite some time. So I'd like to turn it over to him now to introduce her. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, uh, for the opportunity and for uh, making this uh, 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 visit possible. And it's a uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, this afternoon um, a person who uh, I have a uh, admired for uh, for uh, many many years because of her her work, uh, her commitment, and and everything that she has done for for her communities in Guatemala. So uh, Irma Alicia, uh, welcome, bienvenida to, uh, to uh, Madison, Wisconsin via, via Zoom. It's a pleasure to have you here with us this today. And uh, everyone, I'm glad that you are part of this discussion today. And uh, Dr. Irma Alicia, it's um, uh, Maya Kiche, a social anthropologist and journalist. She has been at the forefront of uh, struggles for respect for indigenous culture. Um, some years ago, she was the executive director of the Mecanismo de Apoyo a Pueblos Indígenas, or Shlahuxikin uh, Support Mechanism for Indigenous Peoples. That was from 2005 to 2013. In 2002, she played a key role in the historical process of setting legal precedent through a court case that made racial discrimination illegal in Guatemala. Uh, she, has, um, she has a very impressive uh, uh, career and, and uh, as academic. She has uh, published a uh, couple of books and several publications. Uh, the latest one, La Justicia Nunca Estuvo de Nuestro Lado. It's, um, it's an expert. Uh, Peritaje Cultural Sobre Conflicto y Violencia Sexual en el Caso Sepur Sarco, Guatemala. If you attended the last yesterday's session, she presented on that. She has asked to publish uh, Lunas y Calendarios, Poesía Guatemalteca 2018. And um, one of my favorites, La Pequeña Burguesía Indígena Comercial de Guatemala, Desigualdades de Clase, Raza y Género. Uh, she is a columnist in uh, El Periódico, uh, a weekly columnist in El Periódico, uh, a paper in, in Guatemala. She, has also, she also writes for uh, Counterpunch, an online news source. But um, you can, uh, I'm sure you will be able to find more about all the writings that she has done through her uh, career. Uh, right now, she is an she is at Stanford University and at uh, Edward LaRocque Thinker Visiting Professor at the Center for uh, Latin American Studies. And she also has uh, been a visiting uh, professor at Brown University, Duke University, and at the University of Texas Austin where she got her uh, PhD. So, like I said at the beginning, uh, she's she's been at the at the forefront of the struggle in in Guatemala, in 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 documenting and defending the dignity and the lives of, of people, especially women. Who are uh, um, you will learn more about that today. I'm sure in the context of uh, of a, of migration. So it's an honor to have you here with us, in Malicia, and and welcome again. Thank you, Mario. Thank you so much for your words. And now I want to share my computer with everybody. Se ve bien, Mario. Did you see this, Mario? 
Sí, se ve muy bien. Gracias. Ok. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Haven's Right Center for Social Justice, Centro Hispano and Caribbean and Iberian Studies Program, and the Chicano and Latina Studies Program for the opportunity it gives me to be able to make this presentation. I must recognize that reflecting on migration and race was a, a difficult undertaking since I cannot separate myself from the topic. I am a social anthropologist as well as a journalist, but most of all, I am a Maya Quiche woman from the highlands of Guatemala, a country which has been in the headlines these past years because of the recent exodus of millions of migrants and the in inhuman policies of family separation prom promoted by the country from the halls of the power, which have produced the death of many Guatemalans children, all of whom came from diverse indigenous Mayan communities. In other words, for us as an indigenous people, what has been defined here as a migration crisis is in fact the continuation of a process of genocide that we see through the destruction of the future generation that should take our place. Nevertheless, speaking from my multiple identities, but especially based on my experience as an indigenous Kiche person, it is impossible for me to discuss migration simple as an analytical category or as an exclusively negative or criminalized process. This is because for us as an indigenous people of North, Central or South America, Migration historically has not a necessity for survival as it is now due to the pressure of the global economic system. Instead, it was part of a rich process of commerce and intellectual and, and cultural exchange, which already exist, existed in the pre-Hispanic era and which was radically modified by the beginning of colonialism 500 years ago when Hernán Cortés arrived in April 1519 to what is now the port of Veracruz in Mexico. Despite the, 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 despite the destructive and brutal impact that took place in many indigenous areas, those exchange circuits managed to survive and remain vibrant until today. In this way, my perspective on migration and race are tied to my personal analysis, which I will share with you. As a young girl of seven, already fully incorporated into my family businesses. I saw migration as a normal in my kitchen war, and they were and, and they were motivated by commerce, spiritually, religion practices, or other reasons. This commerce had, take, had taken place since ancestral times when today's political borders were bizarre and existing civilization viewed the exchange of people, knowledge, art, power, goods, or products as a fundamental for the growth and consolidate as people. Indeed, my great, my great grandparents, great uncles and great grandparents invest six months of the year in those commercial circuits, which allowed them to escape forced labor for requirements promoted by the Guatemalan state at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. 
At that time, being a merchant was one of the few ways that indigenous men could avoid being swept into the system of, of forced labor that the white, racist, and conservative criollo state imposed and which entire families were obliged to perform. Given this legacy of exploitation that has been omnipresent in the indigenous social memory, I slowly learned that we as indigenous families and people should fight to escape exploitative and poorly paid work or servitude not only because it was hard, but also because it was profoundly discriminatory. Indigenous men, and particularly indigenous women, were not considered human beings. Rather, they were treated as beings. And the majority of indigenous women were raped by their employers, their employers' children, or other workers. So I understood that migrating for commercial reasons should be done as a means to improve, prepare ourselves and return to our places of origin, as dozens of Kiche men did as they sold our region's products in southern Mexico and even Honduras and El Salvador. They return not only with new products, but also with new ideas that they try to put in practice with their family members. This led them to start different factories in the mid in, in the mid 20th century in the capital, in the capital and a few other cities in the countryside. Nevertheless, it was the men who, who migrated and those who returned was celebrated with festivities. At that time, women did not usually migrate. It was commonly thought that we had many opportunities to develop as a women in our communities, as embroiders, weavers, business owners, service providers, or working in many other activities. Regardless, it was difficult to think that we could achieve the same opportunities beyond our own culture, cultural and communal world because of the violent and brutal races that we all face. Therefore, our community represented a cultural shield that protected us from the races for the external world that crushed us materially and economically. For that reason, we were taught to remind within it because we were safe there. Although, Although in, uh, although in doing so, this means that we as a women live in a system of unequal power relation in which men were in control. Obviously, women always, always search for ways to violate these power circles. And in some way, the majority managed to open windows, even though with severe difficulties. I met many of those women as elders and they are all inspiring examples who always accomp accompany, accompany me. Furthermore, that Maya Kiche world in which I grow was teaching me that other indigenous worlds also migrate, but in different ways. Their migration consisted of hundreds of families from rural areas and poor communities descending for weeks at a time who always passed through Quetzaltenango to buy the products they needed to work in the, in the coffee, corn, banana, or sugarcane plantations. 
there was a migration of thousands that no one saw. I remember them clearly because they used to buy from my mother's businesses. Their presence meant a good commercial season for us. Among them, all ages travel from babies strapped to their mother packs to elderly men and women, while the later appeared to be in a stable condition when they came down to our city. Months later, when they returned to buy more products before returning to their homes in the highlands, they were thinner and their skin had a yellow cast. This was an experience that repeated year after year after year. And I grew up watching how they were transported in trucks and directed by four men, many of, of whom were from the same communities, only to have a few hours to stock up in Quetzaltenango's markets before continuing their journey to the Boca Costa and Southern coast of Guatemala. In this way, the highland population moved to the lowlands. Years later, I understood their manual labor and its economic contribution when I attended a public college in my country. And I read the work of, academic, of academics who theorize the topic of land and the concentration of the resources like Carlos Figueroa Ibarra, Carlos Guzman Bocler, Julio Castellano Cambranes, Humberto Flores Alvarado, Manuel Villacorta, Edelberto Torres Rivas, among others. Later, while still an adolescent, I migrated from my city Quetzaltenango to the capital to attend college in the midst of the of armed conflict and genocide. I was one of the three young Quiche women who had the privilege to go to a public university and at that time. My parents paid for my education. There were no scholarship and we did not expect any since there was no talk of supporting education for indigenous women. I acknowledge that I was part of a generation of Quiche youth who traveled to the capital with our family support to prepare our, ourselves professionally. Back then, we were perhaps some 100 on one, or 150 Quiche students who traveled in order to study all types of majors from medicine to the social sciences. And we share the common characteristic of, be, of being from the Quiche merchant class owning a small or medium sized businesses that I later wrote about in my book, La Pequeña Burguesía Comercial de Guatemala, Desigualdades de Clase, Raza y Género. This period in, in which I hid my Quiche identity to survive the war showed me another side of, my, of migration, one that afforded us the opportunity to exercise or right to prepare and educate ourselves. While thousands of our brothers and sisters who were just as young were being massacred as part of the scorched heart policy pursued by our, by our own state. In college, during my trips to visit my community, I learned about the unstoppable migration of indigenous communities who were fleeing the repression as best they could. These were the same communities that, year, that years before came to my family business to purchase products before heading to the coast to work. Saying they were stopped 
cutting the crops on the plantation and more than a million and a half fled to their lives. The highlands became ab abandoned as a result of the persecution and state genocide against indigenous women and men. The capital city became a place of, ref of refuge, although hostile for thousands of internally displaced people who stayed in spaces not qualified for living and joined the statistics of those living in urban poverty and extreme poverty. It was there that the majority of indigenous women were forced to leave behind their indigenous clothing, languages, culture, and peoples. In my place of, ori of origin, migration due to the persecution was selective. And although state-sponsored terror shocked us, we did not face the massive exodus that was occurring in the rural areas. Likewise, the public university where, where I was studying lived, lived through the, exta, the exile of deans, professor, staff, and students from one day to the next, following kidnappings, attacks on campus, persecutions, murders or tortures. All those who were considered enemies of the state migrated. The public university also faced the massive loss of extraordinary generation of thinkers and students. We were left as orphans of academic debates that never came to be. I am part of that generation of university youth that had to prepare itself with what, with what little was left behind in the wake of state brutality. This required hiding the fact that we were university students or indigenous university students because if we had fully assumed our identities, we would have been condemned to death or exile. Even today, as I write about this period of my life, it is very painful for me to remember that it was necessary to flee, to flee my country simply for wanting to prepare ourselves academically or in the case of the faculty for teaching in a country that fought against knowledge. Generally speaking, discussion in academic circles and analysis deal with the Guatemalan migration of the, 19, of the 1980s, caused by the political violence that I just cited. They also focus on how the hostile and, viol and violent spaces of power poverty and discrimination in US neighborhoods where Central American refugees fled, led some to form gangs to defend themselves. When they were later deported back to their homes, countries, they gave rise to some of today's most violent criminal groups that have slowed up two or three generations of youth. Nevertheless, this analysis in, is missing from the current US administration political discourse. Instead, migrants today are depicted with racist stereotypes as a criminals, traffickers, rape, rape, rapists, among other pejorative labels, labels. However, beyond the bubble of the current administration, the other reason why Guatemalans continue to migrate after, after the signing of the Peace Accord in 1996 
during a period that was supposedly democratic are not gen gener generally discussed. And I question the tendency to present migration as a, homo uh, as a homogeneous category that, do that do does not account for the complexity of origin, race, ethnicity, history, and the usurpation of resources and territory, to name just a few. Working as a young journalist, I could see the continuity of the migration. At that time, we lived with the sense of hope that the peace accords had brought, but those hopes were dashed when we understood that the peace was on paper. In everyday life, a structural condition began worsening to the extent that people migrated because Guatemala denies its youth spaces to dream and realize their dreams. It was not just the lack of economic opportunities, but also a extremely few spaces for art, for music, literature, sport, and other human expressions. For example, a specialization in multiple profession, professions were needed, but not available. In other words, we, didn't, we did not have the spaces to give all of ourselves. Therefore, to explore and maximize our potential, we had to leave the country, leaving behind the land we love. Likewise, the youth in the countryside did not have the necessary material conditions to study or work if they so desired. It was clear that in Central America, the offerings of neoliberalism and multiculturalism underpinning the region's democratic transitions remained empty promise, promises, unable to provide a dignified life to the citizens of these countries. And the economic condition that had led to the armed conflicts continued. In fact, they were even worsening in some cases. By 10,000 of the million and a half Guatemala refugees who had fled were in the United States and had established themselves here. Many had legalized their, their immigration status and it was these family ties that motivated those who had remained behind to come this country. So another silent ex exodus began, a down during the night or day, every month and every month of the year as members of the every community began to travel north. Most, but not all of these migrants were men since women of all ages began to migrate in massive numbers, little by little, using their savings, asking family members for loans, selling or panning what properties they had to pay the fees of the famous coyotes or, or, or polleros. The men and women who dedicated themselves to guiding migrants for their communities to different cities in the United States. Indeed, traffickers who are now criminalized in public and institutional discourse who were esteemed men and women in Guatemala communities in the 1990s and first years of the 21st century due to their fundamental role in transporting children, parents, spouses, neighbors, and anyone else who required their services. Furthermore, they received 
community members' gratitude because they helped to re reunite thousands of separate families, thousands of children who were without their parents, the fact that they performed their work transporting lives with just the promise of their work and no writing proof mean that they played a vital role in the region and communities. For this reason, the fee for their serv services was considerable, but nothing compared today's extreme cost to cross Central, Amer Central America and Mexico. It was when organized crime revealed its power in Mexico and began to view the thousands of, of migrants as arms to transport their merchandise, labor to work for them, and the bodies of the women to use sexually that the price of the journey escalated in 2006. The year 2006 was a watershed because the war between the two most powerful Mexican cartels of that moment, the Sinaloa cartel and the Zetas, caused an explosion of violence in urban and rural spaces. Instead, of ending the violence was only increased since then as the cartels have multiplied strength or weakness. Cartel violence affected the thousands of Central American migrants passing through Mexico, forcing the coyotes to find other transit routes or pay the cartels in order to continue their journey. This phenomenon doubled the price to cross Mexico and came to this country, but it also led to the mass disappearances of thousands of migrants whose mothers, wives, children, and family members are still searching for them in a painful caravans. We should ask why the cartel violence and disappearances have not stopped thousands of Guatemalan, Hondureños, and Salvadoreños brothers and sisters from, for, from migrating, for migrating since 2006. To the contrary, the number has risen. This is due in part to the corruption of the powerful elite who seized or Central America state turned them into a bounty that allow legal and illegal economic and political network to strains. As the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, CC for its Spanish acronym, documented through its investigation and cases that it helped to bring to court. In a report it presented the last one year ago, the CC showed evidence of the different techniques used to transform national budget into bounty for private interest, creating circles in which network members could enrich themselves at the public expense. This demonstrated that it was not necessary to have relevant knowledge or a skill to govern our countries, neither was it necessary to be a statesman or woman. Rather, a person only needed to be selected by the elites, by the elites to become the temporary operator, willing to comply with the order of national and international elite. It is true that the cooptation of our state is a complex historical process and has evolved over time. This is what led the peace accord signed in El Salvador and Guatemala to become a blank check 
for the legal and illegal elites to empty the national coffers and for Honduras to descend into one of its darkest and bloodiest stages. As a result, remittance became a life a lifesaver keeping afloat these three economies to, to such an extreme that today remittances represent between the 15 to 20 percent of this country's GDP. Thanks to the remittance that thousands of women and men send home each month, households in Guatemala have bread, milk, or meat to eat. Remittance made is possible for thousands of children to have shoes, clothing, or an education. In addition, they allow millions of women to decline jobs that impede them from caring of their children and to invest their time in different businesses. Remittances also achieved access to an education for thousands of youth who were able to graduate from high school. The remittances of millions of families in these three countries were crucial in allowing the poor to access decent housing. They also secured clean drink water, electricity, and other services for thousands of families' homes, as well as dignified health care for the thousands of elderly citizens forgotten by this state. In short, remittances are not simple statistics. They are the moral that has prevented our economies from collapsing. In addition, they have enriched commercial banks that benefit from the exchange rate, rates they apply to each family that receive remittances. In other words, remittances have fortified our country's financial systems thanks to the work that millions of Central American men and women perform, which allows them to send an average $300 per month. Yes, it, it is, yes, this is the same financial system that denies access to fair credits for the poor. In this sense, the labor of people who are criminalized here as illegal has come to support the social investment and development that all on, that all on states were incapable of doing due to, due to the corrupt administration of the taxes we always pay, paid. Furthermore, migration in the democratic era was partially instigated by the absence of state institutions in the most remote communities, as well as the capital city because structural and institutional races ignore and deny the right of indigenous people and the poor. Due to the political and economic chaos in all countries, in part, some youth have joined the gangs and uh, have joined the gangs that have currently brought their own brothers and sisters to their knees. Gangs are the fruit of having not invested in Central America's post-war generation. They are also the result of having promoted public policies intended to depoliticize youth who alongside, who alongside some deportees ended up creating armies of violent youth. So against an organized crime groups dividing up the regions, territories, 
initiate, initiating a new and unrecognized war that ruined the civilian population as occurred during the 1980s. As a consequence of this daily violence, beginning in 2007, hundreds of millions of minors began to migrate, a company or an company. Once again, they silently began to leave their parents, siblings, and family members to avoid taking part in the urban violence. Those children and adolescents left the school, left behind their friends, and began a long journey to save their lives and, in the process, their families. Our states did not care about this migration. They ignored it because they were poor children who came from marginal areas or the poorest classes. The majority are grandchildren of the indigenous families displaced in the 1980s who recollected to the cities to save their lives from state repression. They winded up living in marginal areas where you either learned to live with the violence or ended up being a part of it. It was until seven years later in 2014 that then President Barack Obama acknowledged the exodus of thousands of Central American minors who arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border seeking for their stories to be heard, for the system to understand the causes and address their needs respecting their rights while demanding that governments, governments fulfill their mandates. Nevertheless, they ended up locked in detention centers, in cages, or separated from their parents. And when the American people and the international communities accepted these violations and did a little and did little to stop them, it was a sign that they were not interested in dealing with the root causes of child migration which in turn is a reflection of the social injustice and the, and the voracious or economic system in Central America. Migrant boys and girls are the ambassadors who show the richest nation the face of inequality that, reg that regional elites maintained. That was an opportunity to address and understand what indigenous and Afro-Latinos have faced. However, it was a lost opportunity that allowed the toxic mix mixture of injustice to continue fermenting, leading to the massive caravans that we witness live on Duras and expand with Salvadoreños, Guatemaltecos, and some Mexicanos, who reflect the humanitarian crisis we are submerged in due to the internal and external factors. Among these is the exploitation of natural resources belonging to indigenous and Afro-Latino peoples which are giving, which are, which are giving to trust national companies without consultation, immerse, immersing communities in webs of social conflicts, creating atmosphere, sorry, Immersing communities in webs of social conflicts, creating an atmosphere of chaos impossible to live in. 
The exploitation of resources and territories is crucial to understanding current migratory processes. Today, there are more than 1,000 conflicts related to the exploitation and usurpation of territories just in Guatemala. The companies involved with Russian, US, and Canadian fin financial banking, among other countries, have exacerbated divisions within communities, forcing many to flee and migrate. In the past decade, all those who can have fled my country. In fact, the most recent national census presented, presented last year report that 5 million Guatemalas now live outside of the country. What does this tell us? That even those who are academically trained have migrated to anywhere besides violent Guatemala. In my case, I returned to Guatemala in 2005 with a profound desire to contribute and it has been difficult. Indeed, the few indigenous women who have traveled abroad and returned to our country have been labeled as a critical and dissident voices. For that reason, our lives have been also been complicated in our homelands. So when I encounter brother and sister here who are making strays in many fields with or without documents, once again, I feel that the market forces have managed to decapitate our beautiful land forcing us to join a new migration movement in order to live and continue fighting. In this reflection, I have tried to show the deep roots of indigenous migration with multiple facets. Pre-Hispanic exchange, later forced labor, plantation work, escape from political violence and genocide, poverty produced by corrupt and outdated structures. The indigenous, the indigenous phase of migration remains in the present humanitarian crisis, although it is overshadowed by the category of migrant that only acknowledges the act of living hope the act of leaving home as the sole solution to survive poverty rates, reaching more than 60% among the general population and 80% among the indigenous population. This rate, together with the extreme violence of recent years, make it impossible not to choose to migrate, to flee, but we, ref we refuse to acknowledge that like in the 1980s, the majority of those who are currently fleeing Central America are indigenous children, youth, women, and men. This is why the solution to this crisis cannot be masked as new forms of, of beneficence that fail to alter the larger power structures that have co-opted all countries. In other words, to truly solve the migration crisis, national and international governments must decolonize their ways of thinking and acting. By first of all, foc focusing on humiliating and caying people on on closing and protective arbitrary borders, the problem only worsens. For that reason, we should focus on the criminalizing migration so that thousands of men and women can return to their different home communities after a lifetime of war. Most of all, because the majority of indigenous people 
decide to close the circle of life in the place where they were born and to rest in the land they and the rest in the line of their ancestors. This thought makes me think of my mother's younger sister, a woman who lived 22 years without papers in, La, in Florida, New York, and New Jersey, working since, since 1967 in, in sweet shops, <clears throat> paid to take care of the elderly, children, or dogs. After working for more, for more than two decades, she decided that it was time to return to her, to her homeland, to live with her family and invest there. So that was what she did. Like her, the majority of migrants that I know dream of finishing their lives in the land they left behind. I myself am a migrant too. I spent part of my life teaching in this country because I don't have the same opportunities in my homeland. I also hold deep affection for this land because it was also where I trained myself and where my daughter grew up and academically prepared herself. After 15 years of studying here, she returned to Guatemala with few options to return to this country due to the eternal and expensive paperwork of the current immigration system. In this sense, my academic and personal experiences have taught me that migration is basically a human process that we should not reduce down to a statistic, talk of chaos or disasters. Migration is also not only about economics and the earnings that feed the GDP of nations. Most of all, migration is people carrying elements of their cultures that are in this indispensable for them to survive in a foreign em environment that despise and dehumanize them. Migration is tied to race and it has different faces. For this reason, the multiplicity of people and wars involved cannot and should not be reduced to a single category that, that is incapable, incapable of capturing this internal diversity. In the case of indigenous people, migration has always been a part of their lives, struggles and escapes. Indigenous people in the Americas have journeyed since long before the European inv invasion and those historic economic circuits with modification and new routes remain relevant today. Therefore, we should demand the right to human movement and not allow it to be denied or criminalized. Migration does not produce illegal people because Ill illegal illegality is a term created by those in power and the market forces that feed of them. Excuse me. There are people without documents, but they are not Ill illegal. So we must fight to reclaim their presence as human beings, not no one is Ill illegal. Migration is not only determined by wars, genocide, and persecution. It is also a symptom of post-conflict areas filled with profound forms of violence. Central America is an example of this. While it is true that migration is fomented by the breaking up of states, 
national elite are also responsible, a few there to hold them responsible for it. Migration in the Central American region is also being <clears throat> it's also being stimulated by climate change and transnational capital that seeks to displace individuals, families, and communities from regions rich in natural resources in order to exploit these areas free from social pressure or mindful accountability. As a result, Force migration is increasingly destabilizing the core of entire communities and peoples. It is reshape them, and this is great consequences for the future of indigenous and Afro-Latino people. This is why we should reclaim the right to safe migration for indigenous people for the poor and especially for children and women. The act of migrating safely cannot be the sole right of the rich white people and those who control transnational capital. Finally, we do not choose the time we are born into, but if we want, we can fight to try and change our era. With this war, I honor all migrant peoples, all the indigenous and non-indigenous women and men who teach us that migration is a journey, not only to prove ourselves, but also to share, denounce, and transform the inequalities that we leave behind. Thank you. And Maltios Chawen. Thank you, Irma Alicia, for that really excellent presentation. So uh, what we would like to do at this point, we have approximately a little under 30 minutes left if we want to uh, um, end by 4.30, that is central time. Um, and so um, she's willing to respond to questions. And what I would like you to do is that if, if you have a question, if you go to the bottom of your menu there, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see participants. If you click on that, you're able to raise your hand, which will alert me that you have a question or a comment, um, and I'll call on you. If, if you're more comfortable doing it, you can also ask a question via the chat function. I just write out a question and I'll read it out. But if you do have a question um, uh, that you'd like to go on screen, we'd ask you to, um, activate your camera, we'll unmute you as soon as I call on you. So does anybody have a question or comment for Irma, Alicia? Jose, why don't you go ahead and, and if you can activate your camera, we'll unmute you. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Irma Alicia, for your talk. It's very wonderful. You covered a lot of terrain. Um, I agree with you in the indigenous right to migration. I agree in general on the right to migration for all peoples, um, but, but certainly especially for indigenous peoples. I guess when I think about making the argument for the right to migration, in the US, oftentimes we think of things very along the lines of economic terms. And the, um, you know, the arguments against migrations tend to be that these are all economic motivated migrations and that we cannot sustain that. Can you just speak to that a little bit and give us, I guess, maybe some advice on how to deal with this type of pushback that we get oftentimes when we're act advocating for migrations without getting, I guess, sucked into this very superficial discussion about economics and, and just how you have how you have maybe handled that uh, yourself? Okay. Thank you for, thank you for your question. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I agree with you, it's not only economic as, as I, uh, as I present, there is many different areas that we need to, we need to think about it. 
one form is uh, uh, that um, for advocacy, I think is the peritajes. The peritajes I think are, are important because they can show the, the judges uh, uh, the, the difference and, and the different reasons that the indigenous people or other people try to came here to this to US. Uh, as uh, we find uh, some people want to see their parents, they want to live with their mothers, with their grandparents. Uh, and other people want to see their uh, wife or their spouse. So there is many reasons. So for, for me, the one important point is to use the, the, the peritajes. The peritajes is very, very important for uh, uh, different uh, professionals. And another, an, an, another important point is to use the indigenous languages. Because when you use the indigenous language, the people has the opportunity to express uh, more free. It's difficult when, when we need to talk in another languages that is, is not on own language. So use the, the indigenous people. And, and, and I know this is difficult because there is a few, a few translators from the different indigenous language, not only from Guatemala, but South Mexico, for, for example, has many indigenous people that live here. But uh, I think uh, it's necessary to create or to work with other organizations that are in the in the border, and they know um, a, many translators from indigenous languages to English. So this is important, and this is my my recommendation: peritajes and use the use the indigenous languages. But probably there is more. But now this is this is uh, what is came to to my mind. But probably there is many more. Uh, re recommendations or, or advice. Okay, we have a question or a comment from Ariel. Go ahead. And please activate your camera if you could. Hi, my name is Ariel. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, and my research will hopefully be in Guatemala um, if COVID allows for it. Um, but it's, I'm hoping to do my research on the education, the educational decision making and migration decision making of young indigenous women. And I am trying to learn Kiche, Maya. So, um, my question for you well, I really appreciated a lot of what you've said in your presentation, especially a lot about um, your background and how hard it is for. For researchers to do the research, particularly when, with your background and your history, um, I, I have some good. I have a, a very good friend of mine who's Kachikal, and he's doing his PhD in the United States. So I, you know, I'm sure a lot of what you shared about um, your undergraduate work in Guatemala, and then I'm sure you have a lot to share about doing your graduate work in the U.S. Um, as he does. But so my question for you is: obviously, I have a very different background from you. Um, and if I can go to Guatemala to do the research as planned, do you have any sort of recommendations or advice to give sort of gra a graduate student who is about to embark on a, you know, ethnographic journey in Guatemala during this historical moment? I mean, people are still, I'm still talking to a lot of people in, um, you know, Quetzaltenango in the Highlands region who are planning to migrate. Um, and just navigating, you know, things are precarious. Things have all, are, you know, even more precarious now. So I just, what advice do you have as I'm going to do my field work, if you have any, <laughs> for a young researcher? Okay, Ariel. Um, well, my, my recommendation is go to, go to Guatemala and explore and explore uh, the country. You know, there is, there is uh, 
buy buy a pack buy a backpack and and and, and go to Guatemala and try to 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 use your quiche, your cachiquel, or, or continue studying quiche and cachiquel there with the communities and with the people, you know, and try to to um, live with them and try to understand the all the the difficulties, but also the hopes and the dreams that the people has there, you know. Guatemala is a beautiful country. We have almost everything, but the problem is the, for me, is the economic system and the elites that control, uh, that control all the, the economy, but also the culture. So it's, it's difficult for, for us, but uh, my recommendation is go there, go and explore, uh, live, um, make friends, travel, travel around and the people the people will teach you inimaginable things. All right. Uh, just a reminder for anybody who is interested in asking a question or raising a comment, you can do that by um, going to the participants uh, um, function down at the bottom of your screen. Simply click there and you can raise your hand and I'll see that and I'll call on you. I have a question uh, from Edward uh, would like to raise a question. And again, if you could activate your camera when asking. Edward, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you had me unmuted, I couldn't get in. You had me muted, I couldn't get in. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, it was very good. Um, I joined you late, so I got confused about the starting time. I came at 3.30, so I missed the first part. I didn't, I don't know where you're from. I, I thought I heard that you were from the Quiche region. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What, which, which city? Quetzaltenango. Oh, Quetzaltenango. Okay, yes. Uh, and I wanted to tell Ariel to please write me an email because I think I could help you with your, with your research. Uh, but my question is, uh, why doesn't the, the majority population of uh, Guatemala are indigenous people? Uh, why don't you vote out the elite? You had a you had an opportunity when that that lady who won the uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was running as a candidate, and no one, well, very few indigenous people voted for her. And you notice that in Bolivia, they were successful in, in, in getting an indigenous president, uh, Morelos. And then now again, Arce is the new president. Why doesn't the, the majority of the population, the oppressed population, vote to eject the elite? Okay. That's my question. <laughs> Thank you, Edward. This is an incredible question. This is okay. I will try to answer you. Uh, you're right. Now, Bolivia is an incredible example. It's, uh, it's like a dream came true for indigenous people again, you know, but Guatemala is different. Um, Guatemala, in Guatemala, the almost the majority of the population, probably 50, 60 percent, depend, you know, where you are living, uh, is indigenous. But we have an inside, there is many divisions, many divisions for, and those divisions are promoted by the uh, political parties, religions, uh, for the international capital from the international organizations. So inside we have a different fragmentations. This is the problem. And Bolivia is different. The political consciousness inside the indigenous people in Bolivia is very, very strong. They are very clear about the road, about the way. 
but in Guatemala, uh, there is uh, there is a lot of multi multicultural poli polit politics. So the government, after the peace accord was signed, used many indigenous leaders and gave them some spaces in the government, some few spaces in the government. So this, um, uh, this strategy of the government was useful for the system, not for the indigenous people, but for the system, because there is another way of the division of the indigenous people in Guatemala. So there is many problems that we have inside as an indigenous people. You know, we have uh, many professionals, many indigenous professionals in different areas, but they work for the system. This is problematic. We need to change this, but it's not easy. And also the majority of the poor people are controlled for the mass media or controlled for few gifts. So it's, it's problematic, but Bolivia is different. And it's a good example. Who, uh, we celebrate this, uh, this new triumph for Luis Arce. And uh, this is the best example that uh, the, when the indigenous people is conscious of the place, of the history, and they know what they are living, they are very clear what they wanted. So thank you for, for this and thank you for remember us what we need to work inside our country and inside our indigenous communities. We are the majority. And if we work together, we will put the president the congressmen, congresswomen, and uh, all the important uh, um, uh, leaders in our country, but this is not the, the reality now, probably in, in the future. Okay, I, Haider, you had your hand up, but uh, do you still have a question? Perhaps. Yes, I, I, I have a question. Um, I, I would like to do my question in Spanish if that is allowed. For sure. Um, bueno, este, Irma, muchas gracias por tu presentación. Eh, realmente muy, pude ver la, la de ayer y la de hoy, y realmente muy inspiradora. Eh, tengo dos preguntas eh, con respecto a, a, la, a, la, a la migración y, y con respecto a, a las generaciones que, se, que están cambiando. Mi primera pregunta es si han existido conversaciones entre diferentes generaciones, por ejemplo, las generaciones que, que sufrieron el conflicto armado y tuvieron que emigrar, ya sea si regresaron a Guatemala o no regresaron, pero que están conversando con las nuevas generaciones de, 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 de guatemaltecos en cuanto a, a cómo se está recordando, cómo se está llevando esta historia o la memoria colectiva entre las mismas generaciones del país. La segunda pregunta es en respecto a no solamente la migración hacia los Estados Unidos. Yo creo que siempre se tiende a pensar que migración es Latinoamérica, Estados Unidos y nada más. Pero si, 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 si hay, por ejemplo, las relaciones con México o, o con otros países centroamericanos, donde muchas comunidades, muchas gentes, sobre todo en el Ixcán, cruzaron la frontera con México y muchos de ellos se quedaron. Entonces, no sé si, si tienes información sobre estas generaciones que se quedaron en otros países latinoamericanos o que viaja, o que estuvieron en otros países latinoamericanos o en Centroamérica como México o como Guatemala, pero como El Salvador, que, que, que ahí buscaron refugio y no necesariamente llegaron a los Estados Unidos. So a very quick translation. The first, there's two questions, one having to do with whether there are conversations taking place among, between generations of Guatemalans and whether there's the development of a collective memory, particularly younger generations who are le learning about the past and especially the civil war and all of that. And then the other question was about um, the fact that there's migration that takes place between uh, 
Guatemala and other Latin American countries, is in particular Mexico, um, and if she can comment on that as well. Thank, thank you, Heider, for your questions. Uh, I, I, I didn't work with uh, people that, uh, that left in Mexico or Costa Rica or Europe, because as you say, you, you, you write not only the migration was not only to, to US, but to other parts of, of, of countries near to Guatemala, but also Europe. And uh, you know, with uh, all the in the recent in, in the recently years, with all the ten, ten, with all the technology, it's more easy for the people to be connected. So, especially the youth people has a lot of relationship. They have a lot of channels, uh, channels, and they and they and they work in different spaces. For example, um, the, in, in, in the movies, documentals, uh, and the art, and the, through music, uh, uh, through painting, uh, poetry. So uh, inside the youth, uh, the youth generation, they have more relationship, relationships, they have more communications, and this is good. And about the, the memory, the collective memory, and how this uh, to, to to translate between generations. This is a good point, uh, Heider. And I think this is, we need to work about this memory in, inside uh, different generations, the people that decide to, to stay in Mexico, how they rem remember and, and, the, and, the, and the relatives that, that uh, return to Guatemala and the majority live in, in very difficult condition, but they want to live in Guatemala and, and they want to uh, fight from different communities. Some, some of them I live in the, in the Petén, very far away from the, from the city in, in, without uh, uh, water, electricity, uh, the health condition and terrible, especially now with this uh, pandemic. Uh, but but also they have another possibility. They 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 live like in in um, some autonomous in autonomous spaces. So you know it's, it's difficult. But I I agree with you. We need to work with the social memory, historical memory uh, between those those generations or between all the generations now. But the youth people is incredible. They are connected, they are using everything. So you can find a lot of examples between, uh, between them. Uh, so I have a question from Samantha, which is very similar. I mean, she wants, apparently you would, she would like you to elaborate a bit on the ties between the Guatemalan immigrant communities in the United States and the communities back home in Guatemala as far as their support for social movements, what specifically for social movements in Guatemala? Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, the the people that live here has a lot of ties. The majority, probably not everybody, no. But this is different uh, his, his stories. But the majority has ties uh, with their family, and uh, uh, so, but. To, to think about uh, to build a social movement, this is a good challenge. This is the challenge. And uh, this is important. Some are thinking about this and are talking about this. Uh, I had the opportunity to went here in, in San Rafael, California, in, also in Berkeley, in, uh, and in other different communities here because the, the Guatemalan community and indigenous community here in California is, 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 is um, uh, strong, but it's a lot of people that live here and they are talking about this. They are, they are speaking about, we need to change the government. We need to organize as a political because we, we, we somos una fuerza. We, we uh, also sent every month uh, uh, millions of dollars to our country. The 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 economic stability of Guatemala depends of the of the Guatemalans that live, work, and send their money uh, to there. So now uh, there is uh, probably is is um, 
is born this discussion, but this is important. And I totally agree. The, people, the Guatemalan people, the indigenous people that live in US, is they have power and they need to use the, their power, not only through the money that they send them, but also they need to push for another social uh, system on another uh, political system in Guatemala. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have time for one more question or comment if anybody would like to do that. Is there anyone who has a comment or question for Irma Alicia? This is your last chance. <laughs> Well, it appears not. Um, so, well, thank you so much for this. This was really marvelous. We're really, of course, regretful that we weren't able to host you here in person in Madison, but we're also grateful for the existence of this technology such that we were able to have you deliver these two wonderful talks um, and, for, and to record them so that we can post them to our website and other people can uh, benefit from them. Um, so thank you very much from all of us for these, these last two days. We really appreciate it, uh, sharing these experiences. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you in all the institutions and center that invited me. Uh, it's, it was an honor to be with you. And uh, well, we need to work from, different, from all the different spaces that we are living now. So thank you. Thank all right. you. So just uh, for those of you who are still uh, with us, um, I just wanna make a plug again for our talks next week. We have talks by Stephanie Luce and Helen Scott, who will be respectively, that is, talking about the possibilities and limitations of worker organizing and anti-capitalist movements and Rosa Luxemburg on literature. You, I posted in the chat a link to our website where you can see all of our talks this semester. You just register for them free of charge, and we'll send you the link to the talks. Thanks again to everyone, and thanks again to Irma Alicia and all our co-sponsors. Thank you, Patrick. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>